Do you believe that stoning is stoning, sorry, is part of the Islamic Sharia? No, no. Are Hajj punishments like cutting the hands of thieves still applicable today? My answer will be controversial because many people would think automatically, yeah, that's the law of God written in the Quran, it must apply for all time. But it's not so simple. And it would seem that in modern times when there is so much concern with preserving the human body, even replacing a hand, uh, and, and even doing uh, tr uh, transplants of the human hand now, uh, that uh, it would be out of place to apply such a ruling. Naturally, we need deterrence and we need to call people to what is good, but there are other ways of doing that. Um, there's nothing in the Quran that says that uh, one who commits the act of blasphemy uh, should be punished in, the, in this warning. life. Yeah, uh, there, there, there's certainly warning of dire punishment in life hereafter. Yeah, but in this world, I but guess. in this world, no, there is no such punishment. On the contrary, it is clear that uh, people committed blasphemy in the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, or apostasy, if we use mm -hmm. that term as well. Um, some people were saying to each other, according to the Quran, let us accept Islam by morning and then renege in the afternoon. Uh, so that uh, other people may leave with us. Right. Uh, so uh, if, if the Prophet, peace be upon him, were penalizing people for blasphemy at that time, uh, nobody would have dared to do this. Mm -hmm. but, but in fact, he wasn't penalizing, and that's why people could actually play around with the religion as they did at that time. So, but that's between them and God. The viewer is asking, do you want secularism in a Muslim country where it's law-based is on human reasoning? Uh, meaning that secularism, obviously, will have a human-based uh, yeah. uh, reasoning b uh, as the basis of its law. Um, so what I want to, more generally, more generally, uh, I feel that it's, it's best that uh, the, the rule is governed according to uh, the majority um, the, the decision within, uh, within a particular state. So that uh, you know, th there is a gradual process and things changed based on majority votes to, uh, you know, there's a new proposal and then um, there's so a democratic society. De democratic sort of system. Uh, this, this seems to work best in our modern times. Uh, a democratic system works well. Um, uh, so let's say we have a, a purely Islamic theocracy, mm -hmm. and uh, now uh, so, uh, eventually you have non-Muslims uh, entering that society, living there, and uh, they grow in numbers. Now, naturally, the question of minority rights uh, come up, and this is where uh, Islamic societies need need to change in that they have to recognize the rights of minorities, they have to recognize the rights of women, uh, of uh, people more more generally, rights of elderly, uh, and and this is where they're failing. It's not that they're not democratic. It's just that uh, they are not looking at uh, the, the rights of, of, of various um, entities. And uh, if, of course, uh, a society so changes that the majority becomes non-Muslim, then there will be no sense of imposing an Islamic law on them, and the law will naturally evolve to be a, a, a secular type of law. Could you talk about the recent fatwa in Pakistan, which gives rights to inheritance, medical care, basic life security, and marriage? for transgenders under Islamic law in Pakistan? I looked at it briefly. It's widely reported about in British newspapers uh, from the year 2016. Um, and uh, I, I don't have any difficulty with that. Uh, naturally, trans transgendered people need to get married as well. And the fatwa says the most reasonable thing, that they're allowed to to get married, why not? And we, we know that uh, in uh, some, some countries um, with a Muslim orientation actually uh, do um, even fund uh, the, the um, operations that will help a person to um, become the gender uh, that uh, they are choosing to become. Um, in order to smooth out uh, the transition and, and make it possible for uh, persons to get married uh, fitting within the normal patterns of classical Islamic jurisprudence. Uh, you see Christmas decorations everywhere, you, there's a festive spirit, you know, songs are being sung. You know, it, it's, it's an exciting time of the year for everyone. And people are happy, joyful, you know, um, people are giving to each other. It's a good time of year. I have to admit I, I love this time of year <laughs> because I, I get really excited as well. Uh, so, you know, how do Muslims deal with it? So, uh, here, here again, the answer is not easy, uh, but uh, we, we can say that uh, you've just identified many good things about Christmas. Uh, the spirit of cheerfulness, of joy, of giving, of uh, caring for other people. Family. Uh, for a family and all of that. Uh, many Muslims will find during the holiday period that it is the perfect time to get together with uh, family and friends, uh, to have a dinner together. It may not be necessarily called a Christmas dinner. Uh, uh, but
but nonetheless, it is this time of year, and it's unavoidable. Uh, the, to, to, it, it, you cannot deny that this is the season, mm -hmm. and, and this is what it is known People for. People have time off as well at this time uh, of year. You have time off. Yeah. Uh, many will benefit from the Christmas, uh, pre-Christmas sales, the mm -hmm. Boxing Day uh, <laughs> sales, uh, and, and so on. Everything has that Christmas spirit. You're going to work. There's going to be a party. You know, it's, it's all part of our society. Yes, and, and when Muslim scholars uh, try to arrive at rulings on things. And you it's know, not people... a religious celebration, it's like a cultural celebration. True, true. Now, in my humble judgment, uh, if we say to Muslims now, look, you, you cannot celebrate Christmas, this is a non-Muslim celebration, it's uh, to do with Christ and, and, uh, and, and, and Christian belief in, in Christ, then um, it, 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 for Muslims now to have that in the back of their heads, man, I've got to resist everything Christmas here, it, it's going to be quite a burden because you're going to go into the shopping malls, uh, of course, if they're open at Christmas time, uh, then um you know, they'll hear the, the Christmas carols piping through their ears. Mm -hmm. And how are they going to block all of that out? Are they going to always going around thinking, okay, man, I'm always committing sin here. I'm hearing this Christmas carol. And, uh, and the I'm more... enjoying it somehow. <laughs> <laughs> and that too, because what can happen is that music has this way of ringing in your ears. After you've left the scene and, you know, uh, you wake up one morning and, you know, this music is playing in your head. Uh, so what do you do about that? You say, this is Satan and let me get it out of my mind. Uh, so it it will be too much of a burden on Muslims for us to say, no, Christmas is something you have to avoid or something like this. So uh, the first is from an individual asking about evolution, whether it's compatible with Islam. Yes, uh, I don't see that there is um, an incompatibility. God is always at the helm. God is doing everything. So mm -hmm. whatever natural processes we are describing, uh, with the help of scientific understanding, deal with Adam and, and Eve. And we would point out that Eve is not specifically mentioned by name. Um, Adam is mentioned. And uh, it, it is not specifically said in the Quran that Adam was the first man, though Muslims have generally accepted this to be the case. Um, uh, from the evolutionary perspective, it is known that, uh, that we um, descended uh, from a, a, a woman who lived some 200,000 years ago, but descended is not exactly the right term. But there are things that we learn from the Quran, and then there are things that we learn from outside of the Quran. The only question is, are these two things incompatible, in which mm -hmm. case we have to choose one and leave the other. Uh, but if uh, there is no incompatibility, then we can choose them both. Uh, it may be that the Quran doesn't tell us how to change a flat tire, uh, but the owner's manual for our car tells us how to do that. So the two things are not incompatible. You can have your Quran in your car, and when it's time to change your flat tire, you bring out your owner's manual for, for the vehicle. Uh, so not everything is, is in the Quran in, the, in those details. Uh, and, and so uh, there is scope for a Muslim to get information from sources outside of the Quran from observation, from empirical evidence. Uh, t tell us about the Iman. Well, sometimes things are exaggerated, mm -hmm. and we have to uh, cut off the exaggeration, shave off the exaggeration to get to the core uh, of, of what a problem might have been and where it, where it started out uh, as a problem. Uh, naturally, if, if, if there, there is jealousy between people. So th there is this sort of jealousy that one has to watch for. And uh, people jealous of you could actually harm you in some ways, in, in physical ways, um, uh, trying again to bring you down. Instead of uh, bringing themselves up and using you as a, as a kind of example, of, uh, as an inspiration mm. for them to lift themselves up, they try to bring you down to their level. Uh, so uh, jealousy is, is a fact of life. And uh, it starts with what people see. People see you with something mm -hmm. new. They see that you look good. They see you have something good. And they start becoming jealous. And then that jealousy can manifest itself in ways that could come back to harm you. Uh, but uh, that, that is a step down from, from saying, OK, uh, the person, by merely looking at mm -hmm. you, somehow uh, casts a spell over you so that something goes wrong with you. Mm -hmm. uh, th this extra step d does not seem to be required, and um, it, it seems that uh, this might have been added on to the basic problem that I started out describing. 
Um, there is, of course, a spiritual world as well. Mm -hmm. But we learn about that spiritual world through uh, an authentic revelation given uh, by God uh, through his prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So either something should be stated quite clearly in the Quran. In this case, we don't have any mention of the evil eye in the Quran. Or it should be spelled out in detail in the words of the prophet Muhammad, mm -hmm. peace be upon him, in authentic sayings recorded from him. And we see here just a brief mention of evil eye without it being spelled out in detail. Uh, the details that we know from folk tales and legends and, and so on and anecdotes uh, cannot be used uh, as though they are the actual sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So while Muslims are required to believe in the Quran mm -hmm. and to follow the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, we're not required uh, to necessarily follow the explanations of those sayings as given by other individuals. You talked about uh, interest and the idea that giving interest is permissible. So can you provide uh, some references and explain how this is possible? The Quran absolutely condemns uh, taking interest, but the Quran doesn't actually condemn giving interest. The condemnation of giving interest, uh, or uh, the condemnation against giving interest, is mentioned in a hadith, which equates uh, five people, the one who gives, the one who takes, the two who witness the contract, and the one who writes it. Uh, but they say that despite this, we cannot equate the two because one is oppression that is taking the interest and the other one is given by because of some necessity. So we don't say that generally giving interest is permissible, but we say that because of the obvious difference between the giving and taking of interest, in order to be able to buy a house in a country like this, this scholars rule that it is permissible to go with a conventional mortgage. But the real culprit is the one who is taking the interest. So. With that in mind, many scholars say that uh, a Muslim can buy a house using the uh, conventional uh, mortgages, uh, paying interest, because what is condemned is the taking of the interest, not, not the paying of it. This is a common question that Muslims ask all the time. Uh, can Muslims take, an, take a mortgage to buy a house? Yeah, it, it's not an easy question to answer because there's a lot of traditional uh, ruling that, that we have to uh, deconstruct in order to arrive at a fair and reasonable answer that is uh, practical for our modern time. When we uh, look at the Quranic verses, it's very clear that the Quran, whenever it condemns interest, it's always condemning the person who's taking the interest or, in the Quranic language, eating the interest. This is a, a, an interesting question. It's about the power of black magic. And this person is saying, um, how do you protect yourself against black magic and is it able to cause death? That magic has been taught by two angels mm -hmm. and then the devils then continue to, to uh, instigate people to use that knowledge. So the knowledge from the angels was good knowledge and then the angel is the devil is now causing people to use that for evil purposes. So it's the use of this for evil purposes that uh, is thought to be prohibited in the Islamic faith. Hmm. Can uh, people be effective in using such magic today? Uh, I, I, I haven't seen any real case of this happening. Uh, and uh, it seems uh, rather unlikely. It seems that if people had this power, they would be doing things that uh, are uh, much, much greater than, than some, some of the individual stories we hear. Like mm. individual stories, somebody says, you know, that somebody looked at me the wrong way and that caused my marriage to fail or mm. I start to lose my jobs or, I, you know, nothing in life is successful for me. Mm. So it seems to me that if people really had this kind of power, they'll be using it to change governments, to you know, to, to enact real uh, changes in the world rather than hurt uh, simple, ordinary individuals. So even people who are non-Muslims, if they do good actions, and they're generally picking the good options from within their range, uh, then uh, God will eventually grant them salvation in, in the life hereafter. Uh, now, if, if I say that, uh, then somebody may ask, well, why even bother to be a Muslim then? Mm -hmm. Because to be a Muslim requires all of this work and prayer and fasting and all of that. Well, we would say first, we do all of these things out of the love of God and that's how it should be done. It's not to, uh, because it's a, it's a duty imposed upon us, but because this is what we love to do. Uh, second, there are many degrees in, in paradise and God may place people in, in various levels uh, of paradise depending on the actions that they perform. So each uh, action has a certain consequence, a good action has a good consequence, and we will reap those consequences in the life hereafter. Those who haven't performed certain actions will not get the same consequence uh, or, or the same good and, and great benefit in the life hereafter. 
second, we, we should say that uh, when God has given us a certain guidance, that's within our range of options to follow that guidance. And, and if we turn away from that guidance, that's going to the negative side of our own range of options. Mm. So, and then we will be blameworthy because within our range of options, we fail to pick what is good and we actually pick what is bad. Lem Key is asking, is there a limit for the use of hadith? Sometimes I feel some Muslim leaders rely too much on hadith to enforce little rules that make little sense in the bigger picture of Islam, or they put too much emphasis on imitating the Prophet instead of submitting to God. Yeah, I, I feel that too sometimes. Uh, we need to strike a balance here. The Quran is very clear that Muslims have to follow the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Uh, the earliest Muslims generally understood this in a general way, like we follow the Prophet, peace be upon him, in a general way. So if he calls for a battle, then the, the, you know his followers are ready to go and defend the, the frontiers. Uh, if, if he chalks out a new direction, he says, okay, it, uh, we've been praying in this direction so far, but now we're going to pray in this other direction, then you follow the Prophet peace be upon him in because he's being guided by by God but uh, some some persons understood uh, that, like they took this to a certain extreme in that they wanted to follow him to every simple and, and, uh, and minute uh, detail out of the love for the Prophet, peace be upon him, and uh, it, it was harmless. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but if a few individuals do that, then it becomes a kind of a model for the rest of us in a way uh, that a kind of an ideal uh, that, that we won't all get there, but, but we'll see that and say, well, wait a minute, we have all fallen so short. Why don't we improve ourselves a little bit? But, but the ideal eventually became the role among Muslims as they thought about this and reinterpreted things. So now they made it almost like a, a, a such an emphasis that Muslims have to follow the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in every minute detail. This is referred to as the Sunnah. And where is the Sunnah recorded? Uh, in the Hadith. And, and so one has to now follow the Hadith uh, uh, in, in very minor things. And uh, if we pay attention to all of these minor things, we lose the big picture because the human uh, mind and attention and focus uh, uh, cannot be divided. It needs to know what are the priorities and focus on the priorities. And uh, what has happened often in, uh, in the minds of a religious person, one who wants to follow the Prophet, peace be upon him, is that one gets caught up in all of the minor details and forgets the big picture. Yeah. And, uh, we need to keep that big picture in mind. Uh, they killed him not nor crucified him, but so it appeared to them. Uh, uh, Abdul Majid Daribadi in his Tafsir al Quran explains the word crucifixion as meaning to kill a person by means of crucifixion. It's not just I the see. crucifixion itself, right, but it's right. an, a method of execution. So, as a method of ex execution, it failed on that occasion. To me, this is what the Quran is saying. They killed him not, and in case they were thinking, but wait a minute, we crucified him. The Quran is saying, well, you didn't even do that, did you? What happened to Jesus? There was a plot to kill him, but they neither killed him nor crucified him. Crucified him in the sense of killing him by crucifixion. That is a definition that has been given in Tafsir al-Quran by Abdul Majid Daribadi, which is a Sunni Tafsir on, on the Quran. So uh, if, if some such person decides, hey, I want to be a Muslim, but I believe that uh, Jesus uh, died on the cross and resurrected from the dead and met with his disciples after, after that, just like the Christian Gospels depict, I, I wouldn't say this person cannot be a Muslim uh, while holding to that belief because I would say that uh, the, the belief that I have arrived at, or the, the commentaries rather, and interpretations that I have arrived at, uh, depends on piecing together these various pieces of the Quran in a particular way. Somebody has the right to do it in a different way. I'm Rabbi Elise Goldstein from City Shul. I'm Gary Vandermeer, the priest from St. Anne's Anglican Church. Uh, showing our solidarity with uh, people of a wide variety of faiths. I'm standing beside uh, Reverend Gary Vandermeer of St. Anne's Anglican Church in Toronto and uh, uh, Rabbi Elise Goldstein of City Shul in Toronto. Uh, together, uh, as people of faith and leaders of faith communities, we want to say that uh, we are strong uh, together, standing for love and peace against uh, hate and violence. Priest of St. Anne's Anglican Church. I'm here with Rabbi Elise Goldstein from City Shul. Uh, we have formed an intentional friendship uh, with uh, your Imam Shabir and your community. And that, that is why we are here today. We are very committed to this friendship. 
But I remember when Imam Shabir came to our synagogue to show support for us after Pittsburgh. May we pray together and love together and learn together and study together in peace with no fear. Amen. Ilyas, Gary, welcome both to the show. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I want to ask, how did uh, an imam and a priest become friends? And, uh, here we have a neighborhood mosque. We should know them. We should uh, go out and have coffee, and we should uh, figure out if we can share in any common purpose. And so that's what we did. I invited him out for lunch, and I persisted and invited <laughs> him out again for lunch. <laughs> And uh, then when it came time for us to hold a neighborhood fundraising con concert to support our local scholarship, I asked Ilias if he would come and be part of the welcome. Uh, we asked a rabbi and a local Roman Catholic nun as well, and uh, it became an interfaith uh, introduction to a concert that was a benefit concert. And the last component of thankfulness is, uh, is what do you do with the blessing that God has given you? When I first came out with some of my uh, revisions uh, of what I, I understood to be Islamic tradition, at first I was opposed severely. This was like in the year 2000 and around that time. Uh, there were mosques in which I used to preach uh, from which I felt myself cut off. There were um, conferences to which I used to uh, be invited. Suddenly I was no longer invited. And sometimes I was even disinvited, hmm. uh, which was always hurtful. And I must add that uh, as much as some people might oppose me because of my, let's say, progressive uh, or ideas, uh, I would call them enlightened ideas, but you know, that's my own opinion. I guess. <laughs>